Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Data Tech Talk. Today I have a very special guest. He's actually the co-founder, one of the co-founders of NannyML. And what is NannyML? Well, let's just hear it from the founder himself. Hi, Hakeem, how are you? Hi, Shama, how are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. Good, I'm, good. I'm very good, thank you for asking. So uh, thank you for joining our show, first of all. And you have a really, really big news uh, that happened recently with NannyML. But before we get to that, I would love to know a little bit more about, you know, a little bit about your background, how you came to co-found uh, NannyML, uh, and a little bit about the journey as well. Yeah, no problem. So basically, uh, just to give a quick summary, NannyML is a startup for monitoring uh, machine learning or AI uh, models in production that are taking business critical decisions. And um, so, yeah, my background, I actually have a very strange background. So I have a bachelor's in biology um, and, and I actually started doing a master's of bioinformatics, which is like this intersection between biology and computer science. And that's where I was like, yeah, okay. Seven years of studying biology is enough. <laughs> um, it's uh, interesting. Uh, it's something I might go back to one day in my life. But uh, so I kind of got really into the machine learning world and I, and I kind of was very entrepreneurial from the beginning. So I knew I wanted to do a startup. So I organized my career a bit in a way around that. Um, and obviously coming from biology background, I was a bit lacking on uh, like the data science side of things or the programming side of things. So I worked first a bit as a data scientist. Um, and then I kind of realized that like, okay, there's a bit of two sides of the technical coin in, in, in our space. And there's the data science side and the data engineering side. Um, and so then I felt, okay, to really build a good product in the space, I should probably understand both. So then I worked a bit, um, as a data engineer, kind of building these like big data systems and, and, and kind of working on that. And when I felt I was kind of understanding that a bit, uh, I started a machine learning consultancy with also one of the co-founders of NannyML, Wojtek. Um, and, and actually the whole goal behind that was was to kind of find a product, right? So we, we always wanted to build a product company. We never really wanted to do uh, services or consulting in that way. And we kind of used it as a mechanism to understand what problems there are in the world of uh, machine learning and what ones are interesting to work on, the most important ones, the most pressing ones, the most value added problems. Uh, and, and along the way, uh, we convinced one of our good friends, uh, William, to join us at Prophecy Labs. And eventually he also became uh, one of the co-founders of NannyML. And, and so that's kind of how we got here to NannyML. Awesome. So since how long are you, um, since when was the company founded actually? Okay. So technically Nanny ML is from, uh, legally from March of, uh, 2020, but I would say like, uh, until the summer, it was not full-time, full-time. And then towards like, yeah, now, I mean, towards the end of the summer, we were really working on it hundred percent of the time, uh, through our fundraising process. And now we finished, uh, that. So. Yeah. No, yeah. this is really awesome. So you recently raised 1 million seed funding round, but before yeah. we get there, you're actually a pre-seed, pre-revenue company. So tell us yeah. a little bit about, you know, how you managed to secure that funding. This is for all the, all the founders out there who are listening in. This is very crucial. So please share with us. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is to ask yourself what type of company you want to build, right? So we were really, really conscious about this. It's not like, you know, we didn't just say, hey, we're building a startup, time to go raise money, right? So there's a lot of people who think that that's the definition. And I mean, maybe for a startup, that's a definition, but they should really look at themselves and say, hey, what kind of company do I want to build, right? And, and so the way we look at the world of it is like, we decided that we want to have a very large organization. We want to be able to make, you know, an impact. Like we want the work that we do to have, you know, really big impact on the companies we work with, on society, on things like that. So we just said, all right, we're going to build a, a very large company. And, and I mean, how do you do that? You, you need capital to be able to do that, right? So, so the reason we decided to go with fundraising first is because like, okay, we, this Nanny ML idea has actually been for like maybe a year and a half or two years kind of floating around. We were bouncing back and forth between what kind of, um, you know, product we wanted to build. Actually we had like a thousand ideas, like really a new idea every week. Some of them are really ridiculous, but this uh, Nanny ML kind of monitoring of uh, AI and making sure that it's like uh, that business stakeholders and decision makers know what's going on and to make sure that everything is, you know, happening as it should. It just kept coming up over and over and over again um and so the the way we saw it is because we had this consultancy it was like the issue with consulting is that you end up uh, you know the way it works is 
you charge a daily rate or an hourly rate or whatever. And, and the thing is, you, it's really hard to focus on building a product while you're also, you know, uh, consulting, yeah. because what happens is it's like you say, hey, uh, I want to work on my product. But yeah, what, what I have to build my clients comes first because we need to survive. So we said, OK, yeah. we don't want to fall into like this limbo. So we said, all right. We know what we want to build. We want to build a very large company. We know we're going to go through fundraising quite quickly. We want to scale quickly. So we just took the conscious decision. All right, we're going to stop consulting and we're going to fundraise. And when we're done fundraising, we're really going to focus on, on Nanny and Mel. And so that's kind of how we got to that decision, how we did it. That's awesome. And back to by Volta Ventures, if I'm not mistaken, right? So yeah. Yeah. Volta Ventures, uh, just for those of you who are watching, they've got quite a few, um, you know, different deep tech, fintech, DevOps, uh, health tech companies under their portfolio as well. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is a great addition to their portfolio for, with Nanny ML joining as well. So, you, you know, you're, you're, you're working with amazing people in Volta Ventures. So, yeah, yeah, um, they're really great. And it was also uh, co-led by uh, Lunar Ventures from uh, yeah. Berlin, and they're also really awesome. So Co-led by Lunar Ventures. Awesome. Uh, I haven't heard of them as much, but uh, definitely because, you know, Volta is, <laughs> is from the Benelux area. I've heard a bit more about them. But um, uh, tell us a little bit about the the um, the actual business solutions that NannyML is solving and the kind of industries that you're catering to. Yeah. So, so. So it's, it's an interesting question, right? So the way we look at it is there's really two main criteria for someone to get value out of an NML, for an organization to get value about, uh, from an NML. It's basically uh, have uh, machine learning models in production, taking business critical decisions, um, and be large enough that paying for an NML makes sense to monitor those models, right? And, and, and so what that means is you have to be pretty advanced already in, in, your, um, you know, in your AI journey, if you will, and uh, so, so today that basically ends up in like the kind of financial, uh, telecom and um, like uh, energy sectors, uh, insurance sectors, they, they're kind of quite advanced in AI. They have a bunch of models in production uh, and it kind of makes sense for them to monitor them. But we're, we're not really industry specific in that sense where we kind of focus most on, okay, do you have models in production making these decisions and are you very big, right? So we're not like really, really focused on the specific industry. It's more on those two, um, those two criteria. Um, and, and, and so once that's kind of in place, uh, you, you should also probably have a very large internal data science team as well. So if you've been outsourcing most of your machine learning, um, it's, 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 you're probably not advanced enough, don't have enough models in production. Again, that's just like, yeah. you know, like uh, assumption, but, uh, um, and, and so then when, when those two things are kind of there, the whole idea is that we monitor uh, data going into a model, the data coming out of the model and the performance of the model when possible. And we provide that information in a, in a dashboard um, where, yeah, data scientists can also use that dashboard, but, but our goal and our ambition is to kind of be this bridge between, you know, the models and AI in production and the business stakeholders. So, so the whole idea is to make that information uh, relevant, to make it easy to understand for non-technical people to know what decisions are my, mo well, what models do I have in production? first what decisions mm -hmm. are they taking and how those decisions change over time and impact business right um could you maybe give us a, a, an example of a uh, real business case that you've you know sort of handled with um and how how the business management team is actually using it to make decisions um so yeah and any is pre revenue right so we do not actually have any clients yet but one of the interesting cases that that came from like our experience at prophecy labs and something that that we really uh, saw obviously you can't give away like a client name or yeah, anything but i can uh, you know yeah. kind of set the scene to the type of problem that it is um and if, so so imagine you have like a, a telecom industry a telecom company right and and they have a model uh, that predicts whether or not a client will cancel their contract in the next 30 days um and, and, and one of the most important uh, features of the model, so one of the most important things that this model takes its decision on is whether or not someone has a digital invoice. So like that they get their invoice over the email instead of a mail. It sounds like a very funny thing, but you know, these models, they make complex relations. So that can mean so many things that someone with a digital invoice, they're younger, they're a millennial, they're more active online so they can get bombarded with ads more, right? And, and so, um, you can see that these models, they're trained on the historical data, right? That the company has. Um, but then imagine uh, the CEO takes a decision and says, hey, uh, we're going green. In, the you know, in three months, I don't want any more paper invoices. 
And, and this sounds like a very silly question, but like the CEO is not going to communicate directly to the AI team about that and probably doesn't even know that that can have an impact on the models that are taking these decisions that, you know, send customers emails to try and retain them. And, and so what will happen in that case is all of a sudden, if after three months, nobody has a paper invoice, and that was the most important thing that a model made the decision on that, that, that becomes useless. And it starts just trying to predict that everyone will cancel their contract. And if that's part of like this automated system, that can become a huge problem, right? Because if it just sends emails to people say, hey, we see that you might cancel your contract. Here's a 10% discount. Um, and then it just sends it to everyone. <laughs> and then, and so, so these are the kind of problems that can arise because um, these models are making decisions based on very complex things. And that information is not very freely flowing through an organization. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so um, I'm, not a, I'm not an AI guru in no sense at all, but I would love to know, for example, um, you know, companies that are putting together different models and they're considering, um, you know, uh, potentially using Nanny ML. Um, tell us a little bit about the data bias that exists in some of these models maybe, and uh, you know, how companies overcome them. Yeah, so, um Man, there's been so many stories, right, in the news about such the most ridiculous things and a lot of it coming from big companies that you think, oh, they should know better, right? Like there was the article not so long ago about um, Amazon stopping to use AI in, uh, in recruitment, right? Because yeah, at the end yeah. of the day, um, the data is as biased as a human is. <laughs> um, and and if, if the historical data in recruitment, say for software engineers, is like 70 or 80 percent male, right? Um, then you're going to end up with a model that just <laughs> doesn't want to interview female candidates. And that, you know, that poses a lot of issues. Uh, and so that's one solution that's saying, hey, um, our machine learning and our data is not advanced enough for us to overcome these biases. So we, we just can't use uh, machine learning in this space. And, and that's something actually that I hope NannyML can really help with in the future, right? It's that instead of just monitoring use cases that are already there, we can enable use cases that were not possible because of these kind of risks out there, right? Um, and also you think about it in the healthcare field that like, you know, there's, um, you know, now with Corona, it's, it's really on everyone's mind uh, with, with, uh, you know, in a lot of places, uh, machine learning can do much better than a human, right? But like, if we don't understand the decisions they're taking and we can't monitor them, we're not going to use machine learning in those fields. And in the end, it's actually costing a lot of lives by not deploying machine learning, right? And so yeah. these are the kind of things where we're hoping that when NNML, you know, is bigger, more robust, that we can actually enable more AI use cases than, than there are today being put into production. That sounds amazing. And I really hope you get there because I can already tell you my, my you know, my dad works at the healthcare department and um, I, I can already tell how much it's important to, uh, to understand and predict different kinds of models, whether it's the spread of diseases, whether it's how uh, resources, healthcare resources will be utilized in different components and based on different financial metrics as well. So absolutely spot on there. Uh, but um, I, I do want to ask you something which is a bit more generic. So what, what actually is the effect of having a static model um, in making bad decisions in business, basically? Yeah, I, I mean, that really depends on the use case, right? If it's not a very... Um, you know, revenue driven or people driven use case, it could not be very important, right? But it's, it's really a proportionate to the use case. So if you have a use case, like in this churn example, I mentioned earlier, where it's directly linked to um, the revenue of a company, right? And you have the static model. Yeah, you can if it's in an auto. So, so basically, you have to separate a few different things, right? So machine learning, you know, it's deployed across departments across it's, it's really used in a lot of places. And there's a lot of danger, specifically in automated systems. So in systems where you have a model that takes a decision and then another system automatically does something based on that decision with no human in the loop, right? Those are where you can really start to have weird things, especially if those decisions are customer facing, right? Or people facing. Um, uh, but, in, but it's still interesting in, in, in use cases where it's not in that automated system where it's just an analysis because in the end, you're going to take decisions based on what the model tells you as a human, right? So, so, so. The impact really varies uh, and it depends on the use case. But yeah, again, it, in a use case like that churn, it can really be that you send uh, a bunch of customers spam that they don't want and it actually makes more customers leave than you expected and things like that. So there's a lot of different uh, things that can happen. Um, but, you know, to be honest, not just static models. So, so 
you know, you can think about the future of AI that maybe in one, you know, one day in the future, we're going to have models that are just always retraining or something. And, and you don't actually um, have this issue of static models anymore. But I actually think there that Nanny ML will be more relevant than ever, ever, right? Because those models will actually, they will be in production and there will really be uh, no oversight and you will really not know what's going on. And you really won't need a human to check up on it every once in a while. So you still kind of need to know what's happening, what are these decisions and what are their impact. And we're hoping that we can actually give an extra level of insight on top of that in the future where you can actually understand your business better because you understand how your models take decisions better. Yeah. Um, so that's like the grand vision of it. Amazing. And uh, I also would love to know, because you've worked so much in AI, um, I, I would love to know, for example, what are the trends that you see in the future? So I've heard about, you know, big data analytics, uh, AI and big data analytics. I've heard about, um, you know, trying to understand, um, let's say, natural language processing uh, better. Um, you know, I've, I've interviewed some founders who are actually in natural language processing as well. And, you know, they are um, allowing you to understand uh, what even a name would sound like, for example, in different different um, uh, areas and locations. So that's that's pretty interesting. Like, just imagine you're doing marketing, targeted marketing, and you know exactly how the name sounds like for someone who's like me coming from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are the other trends that are kind of, you kind of seeing uh, in the AI world uh, right now? So um, I'm, I'm not very good at predicting the future from that perspective. But the thing that I would say is that like, uh, there, I, see, I see that there's a bit of a beyond the hype type thing right now. And I think that's also what makes Nanny ML super relevant. So, so more instead of just, uh, you know, machine learning and AI staying in like this POC innovation department, there's really a, um, a pull to actually start using models in those business critical decisions, right? So, so there's been this thing like, you know, companies, they hired a bunch of data scientists and then they realized, oof, actually mo uh, modeling is not like, it's very important, but like, yeah, we, if the data is bad, we can't really do it anything with it right and so then now there's like this trend to hire a bunch of data engineers to kind of build these systems so i think there's a little bit of a you know reality check and a beyond the hype and kind of understanding what models can do what they can't do where they're good where they're not good and what use cases we should use them for and i, I find that great because that's where like you know the real value will start to come uh when you understand these things but for the field as a whole um it's moving so fast right and and so it's it's really hard to say, like I said, I mentioned a bit before that like, yeah, maybe you don't have to retrain your models in the future so often, or, you know, there's, there's some technical improvements that, that keep going and I, I hope they keep going, you know, at the same pace they are now. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hakim. Um, I do have one last question, and this is actually coming from a uh, recent session that I had in data and anal analytics with um, okay. University Startup Next. So it's kind of like a there's like an incubator program where, you know, the startups come in and they have a lot of questions. They just started out. They're very fresh and that, you know, they're just undergraduates who are, you know, have big dreams and high hopes to, to form the companies. And they were asking about, uh, you know, how, how can they implement um, artificial intelligence with the data that they already have? Um, so for those kind of startups, which are really new and they are dealing with, let's say, customer data, customer information, transactional information, what is the one um, advice or tip you would give to them to start it off? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think that the, the thing that you have to, uh, you know, especially in those early stage startups, you have to understand that like you need good data. So yeah. the data, you know, the data is what AI is not magic. It can only do what is in the data, right? It doesn't do anything more magical. Uh, if your data does not tell you anything, then the AI will not tell you anything, right? And so you need to understand how data impacts your modeling and you need to know how much data you need, the quality of the data and really understand the data well. And I think that's like sometimes uh, something that people forget. They think that, you know, AI is this magic thing and that like, you know, if you just throw anything at it, it will just be able to do anything when that's really, really not the case. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that tip, Hakim. So with that, uh, viewers, we do come to the end of today's show. But before we go, Hakim, where can people find you and where can they reach you? Uh, uh, so they can just email me anytime at Hakim at nannyml.com uh, uh, and then just on, on LinkedIn and yeah, even Facebook doesn't really matter. <laughs> I don't really tweet that much, so you won't find me on Twitter so often. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely tag you so people can find you. And thank you so much for being here today. Thanks a lot, Shama.